it's a very controlling situation to be in when you put your whole life in one man's hands. Women don't have a voice to speak up. It's a cult. It takes away uh, people's freedom of choice. There are certainly thousands of groups operating today. It dictates the way its people live every minute of the day, like a real-life handmaid's tale. He's a self-proclaimed prophet, the man who runs the cult where Queensland's most wanted criminal hid from the law. They have to hand over all of their property and the leader controls a multi-million dollar property empire. Probably better to get out sooner rather than later. It's a full-on facade. They're half men, half shadows. We've spent the past few months looking into extreme religious groups how they work, why people start them, why people join them, how you get out, what happens when you get out, and whether there should be more controls around these very controlling organisations. During our investigation, we uncovered a secret cult called the ACMC, operating across Australia. It controls every aspect of people's lives. Their rules don't allow children to go to school and require members to hand over any assets, including money and wages. To our knowledge, the ACMC has not come under scrutiny from police or any level of government. The first thing with respect to cults is what we're doing here. Bring them out into the light, expose them, uh, have them explain. So from the day you join, you have to give them everything you own. So your property, cash, cars, the clothes on your back. You're told that your body is no longer your own uh, and that you're the lowest of the low. So you're told what to eat, when to eat it, uh, down to the number of sultanas you're allowed to have on your cereal. You sign away your life, all your freedoms, and you agree to live under the rule of the leader who is called the Rashan. Hanging over them the entire time is a threat of severe discipline. We've spent the past three months talking to dozens of people either linked to this group or, or people who were in it and have now left and, and their stories are all very, very consistent. A lot of them are still quite traumatised about what they went through and a lot of them uh, don't want to speak or they don't want to be identified because they worry about how it will affect them now. Basically the life inside for women in the community is they're not they're not treated well they're under a man's control if you're not wearing a headscarf it's like you get in massive massive trouble women don't have a voice to speak up women do feel nervous scared is there violence towards women in the group some of the women have come out because of the violence that goes through like you know getting beaten up and things like that once you come out you're an evil person anyway, you know what I mean? So it's really difficult if your loved ones are in there, you, you're forced to stay in there and you know you can't get out. So to maybe that might be the reason a lot of people don't actually come out because they know they're gonna lose their family and their children and things like that as well. Former members have told us some really horrific accounts of domestic violence incidents under the previous leader who was in charge until 2015. Things like a heavily pregnant woman being slapped to the ground, a woman who had her head rammed into a tree, a woman who was beaten so badly she had to go to hospital, just really serious incidents. According to some court documents we found relating to a custody dispute, there were allegations that multiple male members believed it was okay to physically discipline their wives. We've discovered a document that sets out, for the first time, the shocking rules that govern this community. Everyone must exercise two hours a day with people told to use bicycle powered washing machines. There's one set of clothing per person. Talking loudly or laughing is discouraged. Children must be homeschooled. People must learn to speak an ancient language thought to be spoken by Jesus. And most importantly, especially for the women, never question the Reshan. The hallmarks of predatory cults are the control of uh, its individuals. As part of the investigation, we discovered they have a large commune in North Queensland, and that's where the leader, a man named Asaf Baraka, is listed as living. My colleague and I decided to travel up there to find out more. So we're in Herberton, uh, it's about a 10 minute drive from the property, it's a very small North Queensland town. Herberton in, in this sort of area in general sort of has a, a magnet for people of all walks of life, from artists to fugitives and gangsters. 
We're heading out to one of the ACMC's main properties where we believe Asaf Baraka is living with about 30 other people. It's a huge compound, very isolated, about 15 kilometres outside Herberton. We've got a, a low set brick building here. I'm not actually sure who that belongs to, but right as part of that area there, we've got a mechanics workshop. It's definitely members of the community here and there. We walked around for a bit and sort of yelled out hello. Nobody came out. It's like a pretty, pretty big, well-maintained property. There was a water tank there with, um, with a row of toothbrushes on top of the water tank. So um, I guess obviously they, they, they're brushing their teeth outside. Yeah, a lot of old caravans. Uh, old motorhomes. You're really out in the middle of nowhere here. If, if you wanted to leave and you, you didn't have access to a vehicle, you'd, you'd probably be walking for a while. We do know about one woman who left in the middle of the night really with a young child and walked for a very long time before flagging down a car so she could get into town. She did not want to talk about her time in the community when we reached out to her. We were given a number for a man named Arthur, which is the same number listed for Asaf Baraka in our court documents. Hi, is that Arthur? It is. It's Kate from the Career Mail here. How are you? I spoke to him for 15 minutes and while nothing we spoke about was off the record, he didn't give me permission to publish the phone call. That was interesting. He didn't want to answer any of my questions, but he said he had a hard time trusting people and that he didn't really expect anyone outside the community to understand how they live. And so when I raised domestic violence allegations um, from the past, he, he said, oh, why would you bring that up again? And I'd rather let a dead dog lie. I asked him if, he, if they're running a cult and he asked me what a cult was and he wanted me to give him a definition. At the end of the phone call, I asked him if he was Asaf Baraka and he said that's private. He didn't even want to tell me what his full name was. Um, and then he at one point suggested maybe I wasn't who I said I was and maybe I was from the federal police. So there's some pretty incredible stuff in these documents about the roles that the cult members are allowed to perform. Uh, for instance, that the women are only encouraged to be chefs or personal trainers, and the men are encouraged to take up a trade. Uh, now this is a good one, universities banned for fear that they'll be brainwashed. There's another role that they allow women to do actually. It's effectively a spy for the leader. They appoint a woman at every community and she has to report back on any problems or disorder. It also says here that any money earned by members working outside the community gets taken off them. I spoke to some former members actually who said in the in the time of the founder who's now deceased they were put onto welfare payments but you know never saw a cent. You'd think that some of that money probably went into amassing their property portfolio because they've got properties all over over Queensland, properties in Sydney, overseas. They also draw an income from some of their businesses. They've got the cafe, the mechanics workshop and um, the gym. It's a pretty massive operation. We're on our way to Atherton where the Anglican Catholic Mission community will have a coffee shop. So this is the cafe. It's one of several businesses we found that they use to finance their operations and recruit new members. There's also a lot of staff, 11 for just eight tables. Most of the staff seem to be wearing, or the, the girls at least, seem to be wearing headscarves and they all seem to be wearing crosses as well. A man who has a unique insight into this secretive cult is Steve Perks. He helped a woman escape the ACMC under the former leader. She had actually escaped from the commune into the night, got a lift in a car, went to a women's shelter. She had a child with her as well. Yeah, she had to take the youngest. She talked about domestic violence in the community. But what was one of the incidents that she told you about? A little boy with a disability had, um, had pooed his, had messed himself. They didn't like it and it made whatever that place was unholier than what it was prior to him turning up. They were to get a can of excrement and throw it all through her living quarters. That's not a Christian thing to do. They all seem quite formidable, but they're half men, half shadows. One of the former members we spoke to was a woman named Madeline. She joined the cult in the early 2000s. 
there were posters which she basically said were almost like soft porn in the house that she lived in as an example of what her body should look like. She told us she lost 30 kilos in the first couple of months of living in that house. One trip home to visit her family, she was greeted by a man named Raphael Aaron. Parents will often say, I just don't recognise my son and daughter anymore. I just don't. There's nothing there that's left between the two of us. So to me, the personality change is, is critical. It's, it's actually quite frightening. It was on her second visit home to see her family. Raphael had engaged the help of Matthew Klein. He had escaped a cult called the Twelve Tribes in the early 2000s, and so he knew what was happening to Madeline and that she needed to get out. I took a chance and we actually went for a walk, just the two of us, and I said, I am actually really concerned for you and that um, maybe this group isn't good for you and it'd probably be better to get out sooner rather than later. And that was it. She said, yeah, I, I don't want to go back. So we, uh, we whipped her away somewhere else. So how were you able to access so much material from such a secretive group? Yeah, they actually filed their entire manifesto to the Supreme Court after a leadership battle which led to a dispute over who owns their massive property empire. The ACMC started out in the 1970s when they were known as the Jesus People of North Queensland. Daniel Landieriel founded the group more than 50 years ago. Daniel is a bit of a strange person to describe. He had a very strong personality. He has found a very strict or severe form of religion over the years. We've been told by various people that he had four wives. Daniel describes himself as a father of 16 children. They would have flown under the radar, if not for the arrival of a man named Luke Hunter. Luke Andrew Hunter escaped from jail and for 13 years sheltered at the North Queensland Jesus Group at Herberton. And then in 1996, he staged a dramatic escape from that prison. Him and a fellow inmate armed themselves. Luke had a knife, his accomplice had a screwdriver. They kept 10 prison guards at bay. They managed to cut their way out of jail and Luke basically went on the run and he ended up in North Queensland. He ended up being found by the Jesus people of North Queensland who took him in. Luke seemed to be, you know, well liked, had a new identity within the, uh, within the Jesus people in North Queensland. He was known as Ashban Cadmiel. When I met him, he was a product of the protection that a community like that, and only a community like that could offer. In 2011, Luke had uh, left the community. Police started to track his movements and, and, and follow him around. Police pounced and arrested him. He was lying to you, or he was telling you the truth and you were harbouring a killer? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to, to condemn somebody to hell just because they've lied about their past to protect themselves. The investigation that will be conducted will be looking at who may have assisted him over the past 14 years. I never had any idea. No one, no one would have known anything about it except for the leadership group, which were privy to that. So Steve got to know the community very well. He, you know, he taught the kids basketball for, uh, for a number of years. Steve was probably close as you could get to the community without actually joining the Jesus people. Now, in domestic and family violence law, we have in Queensland the concept of coercive control. And what that is, is the recognition that predators uh, will often use all sorts of psychological techniques to uh, enforce their will upon somebody else. And often the people who are in cults or in uh, circumstances of coercive control feel that they're lost already. What I'm questioning is the techniques used uh, by such groups uh, to effectively steal the lives and eventually the money uh, of the uh, people who uh, they uh, coerce into faith. There's a very real argument that coercive control is so insidious, is so dangerous and is so predatory a tool that uh, it ought to be applied to cults. The disturbing details of life inside this cult that we've uncovered warrant closer attention by authorities particularly in relation to the poor education of children. The scary thing about the ACMC and other cults like it is that they're so secretive that we never really know the extent of what's going on behind closed doors until people escape, and that can take years. 
some people never leave. He has permission from the Virgin Mary to do this and I just thought, oh my God, no. 